You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we're staying in Dublin, Ireland to be joined by Roseanne Longmore. You're very welcome to the show, CEO of Coraflow. Thank you. Thank you, Ream, for having me. Delighted to have you. Three main areas we spoke about before we hit the record button, early influences, challenges, pivotal moment. So with you, no different. You grew up in Dublin? No, I grew up in Mullingar. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Mullingar born and bred and uh, I actually grew up in the army barracks there in Cullen Barracks and um, my father was an army officer and I have four older brothers and um, so that was interesting unfortunately the barracks is now closed down but I know there's a big campaign currently to to you know get it reopened or uh, regenerated for another use so yeah I went to school in presentation Loretto there big school and uh, mm-hmm. then went off to to university in Limerick and my parents subsequently moved out, out of the town, so really haven't had much opportunity to go back since just to visit friends. What was life like growing up in a barracks, especially with four older brothers? Uh, yeah, it was great. It was great fun. It was, a, it was very different. It was a great novelty for any of our friends uh, who would come to visit. Um, Mullingar was a great town insofar as it was a county town and it had a, you know, a swimming pool. You know, in the 80s, really, when many towns didn't have access to, you know, facilities like swimming pool, the tennis club, golf club. So it was a very well serviced town. It was, a, you know, it was a good town to grow up in, lots of facilities that I, I think a lot of other um, people mightn't have access to. So, yeah, it was, it was but not, nothing very dramatic other than a normal Irish upbringing. I know that you did uh, public administration in UL. And before we move on to that and all good things after that, sticking with your early, early days, you've touched on what your father's role was. Uh, is there any one or maybe there's multiple people, teachers, parents, close friends, family members who you believe had a positive impact or influence on the person you've turned out to be today? Um, probably my biggest influence would have been my mother, um, you know, obviously just being the two, the only two girls in the family, but we were very close and, you know, she was really ahead of her time in terms of, you know, she obviously came from a generation where they might, women might not have the opportunity to go to university or, um, you know, if they did have an education, maybe had to leave their job once they were married. So for her, you know, uh, financial independence for women was very important and you know the way she saw that was through education so from a very early age she was very um, keen and enthusiastic for me to go the traditional route of the leaving search university and then make a decision after that so yeah in terms of um, education how important it was it definitely came from um, my mom what's your mom's name June yeah she sadly oh. passed away a few years ago so Shout out to June, uh, and uh, it sounds like she was a, a, a great person and mother. She was great, yeah, and really uh, supporting. She really kind of said, you know, if ever I looked at someone and said, you know, God, they can do that, and she'd say, you know, you can do that. You know, why couldn't you? It was always like, why wouldn't you, or why couldn't you, why wouldn't it be you? So, yeah, she was very, um, she was very supportive. I love it. For, for me, when I was younger, one of the jobs, strangely enough, that I wanted to be was I always wanted to manage and run a hotel until my uncle had a conversation with me when I was about 15 and said, a lot of stress, a lot, lot of hours of work and very little money. So that quickly changed. Was there any role that you as a young Roseanne wanted to be? Um, I always was fascinated by uh, journalism and the news like you know from when I was very small like being a new I think I would have liked to have been a news reader I loved watching the news and um, then journalism the newspapers and then really business in general like in school I had a great uh, there was great teachers in my school luckily and but I really had um, a growth for business studies I just loved it and you know, then, you know, watching the evening news and reading the papers, just that whole general area was very, it was fascinating for me. You've achieved a lot in your career referencing business, Uh, started career as an office manager for an investment manager company, and then you spent almost six years at Davey, finishing up as, I'm reading here, the COO of the wealth wealth management department. So my question to you is, in those uh, six years in Davy. do you believe that they helped you 
when you went to launch your own company? So any lessons learned that you could carry over, whether it was mistakes that you made that you didn't make later on when you set your own company or lessons, connections, relationships, was that an important, those two roles, the first one as well, helped you and were they important in starting your own firm? Yeah, absolutely. I think they were really critical because I started off, when I went to my degree in public administration, my, my aim was to go into, um, into the civil service. Actually, that was that was what the degree is really focused on. But I did a very short stint, six months in the Department of Health, and then a year in um, in university. And I realised at that stage the public sector really wasn't uh, for me. So I quickly uh, moved into uh, the world of investment banking, and I went in as a general manager, really as a PA to the managing director in Australia. They opened an Irish office. Um, a global equities office and from there it was the general nature it was a small like 24 people so I would be doing everything from you know working with the portfolio managers to the office management whether it was rental agreements you know the IT HR mm. so I loved the general nature and I felt like I got a quite a, a good understanding of building up a business Unfortunately, in the recession, that business closed down. So I was there to actually wind it down as well and uh, maybe deconstruct everything that we had built up. But then moving into Davy like that, um, I started in private clients and I had done a project management uh, qualification in the in prior years. And uh, yeah, they just really gave me the opportunity to move around the business. So I never really, you know, I loved seeing how different areas worked. So I, I actually had a role as a manager in client operations and then moved back up to, to front of house or to, to client facing position in private clients. So yeah, I, I felt, I feel like my skill set, I'm kind of jack of all trades, master of none. And I think if in a startup, that's exactly what you have to be. So in fact, Whereas my, you know, my skill set or my CV might look a bit general for some roles, for a startup, it was actually, um, it really lent itself to, to working mm. in a startup. I hope I have a pronounced or I'm pronouncing it wrong, Coraflow, but for anyone before we move on, could you take 30, 60 seconds to explain what it is and what was the gap? I know the story behind it, but what was the gap that you saw that led you to starting the business? Okay, so Coraflow um, have developed at the world's first breastfeeding monitor. So currently, the World Health Organization recommend that mothers exclusively breastfeed to six months. Uh, unfortunately, only about 13% of mothers in Europe achieve this target and wow. it's similar in like 19% in the States uh, and around yeah. the world. So when you look at all the studies that examine um, the reasons women stop sooner than they wanted to, one of the main reasons uh, globally is concern regarding low supply. So mothers are not sure if their baby's getting enough milk. So they start to supplement or they switch to formula. So there's been uh, really a, a product development race to, to, um, to find a way to measure breast milk supply. So the current method is weighing babies. You know, they weigh a baby and then they feed the baby and then they weigh the baby, but it's not <laughs> recommended. Yeah, it's not recommended due to the, the levels of inaccuracy. So um basically there we have developed women wear nipple shields they're silicone yeah. nipple shields about they're as thin as a contact lens and we have patented a micro flow sensor that sits within those shields so the mother wears it like a regular shield and then as her baby feeds the data comes up on her phone uh, on the app how much milk her baby is getting so um yeah it's very exciting it's, it's a work first Absolutely. That's a uh, very cool business to be involved in because you'll have a consistent supply of uh, customers. Um, is there a commonly held disbelief about your industry, the startup one uh, that I'm talking about here that you disagree with? And if so, what is it? Um, I think uh, probably that, you know, entrepreneurs and startups are all risk takers are very high level of have a very high risk appetite um, I think that's and certainly I even remember that in my leaving cert you know what were the characteristics of entrepreneurs and it was this um, uh, you know uh, maybe preconception that you have to it has to be like a, a massive risk I think from what we learned when we started out was we de-risked the business model and the the problem the solution as much as possible before we left our jobs to start the business so uh, on, on the side of our CTO and founder, um, 
uh, on the technical side, the patent had been filed. There had been kind of two years good technology development. Um, mm. and, and the same with the academic research and the business model. We were fairly, you know, well advanced before we decided that we would go at it full time. So I do think um, for people who have an idea and they want to, to start their own business, you can do a huge amount of groundwork while working in your full time job or, you know, before you take mm. the, the big leap. Now, I think it always has to be done and it's a risk. But I would be a big believer in de-risking that uh, the proposition as much as possible. Definitely risks involved in anything we do in life. Um, but interesting, second podcast of the day this is, and the first guest, I posed a similar question to them, and they said that uh, it's calculated risk-taking. So they look into everything, and then they decide to take the leap rather than just throwing something yeah. at the at the solution or potential problem. Um there's this book that I read. It's on my shelf. Uh, people, regulars and listeners will hear me bring it up. It's called The 13 Blind Spots That Can Hold Back an Otherwise Healthy Business. So things like not focusing on lead generation, hiring, onboarding. You could even call the pandemic a uh, blind spot. Although that wasn't listed in the book because that hadn't happened at this stage. Is there a um, blind spot that you may have dealt with in the early days but that you've since overcome or one that you may see a lot of people in the in a similar space to you consistently hit that if you felt they nailed that blind spot whether it was getting the hiring process correct focusing on lead gen and having a process for that that they'd be in a much better position than they currently are yeah, the one I would think uh, I come across quite a lot, and it's even kind of even bringing it back even further than that. And it sounds very, very boring, but it is really the market research. And what I when I speak to a lot of the, the startups, um, you know, in the incubators or in the colleges, you know, I, I could tell them just focus on one question. Is somebody going to pay for this? What you're offering is someone going to pay? There's a lot of build it and they will come. There's a lot of really nice um, solutions out there, but is there really a problem in the first place? And is somebody willing to pay for it? Because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, I think, especially in software being developed where, um, you know, it's a feature, it's a nice benefit, but would somebody download it and actually pay a subscription or the same with products? So I would, it's that market research piece where people need to go out, you know, they think they have a great idea and it possibly is, but they really need to, to, you know, figure out what's the size of the market, how many people, what are people willing to pay for it? Uh, and I think that can be kind of missed in the excitement of developing something you think is great or, you know, with your co-founders and starting a company on the back of it. Usually this far into a podcast, you know, 15 minutes or so, I'll have a fair idea of like the, the guests themselves, uh, their experience, the, the hiccups, the successes, in their journey and you come across as a uh, very wise and intelligent person how do you consistently invest in yourself i know that you uh you touched on you went to ul i know that after that you did a diploma in applied project management uh, at ucc you've got your qfa are there any books podcasts uh, mentors that you that you go to a circle of trusted people that you go to as well how do you consistently make sure you go to that next level on the ladder yeah i love to read and now that all the books are on audible i tend to listen now to quite a lot of books because of my my commute so um i loved like at the very beginning before we made the jump into startup world we would have read all of the you know the lean startup venture deals all the american yeah. kind of books that startups should really go to lost and found or these type of books they were just incredible stories interesting a bit different to the European model of a startup. There are differences there. So I was yeah. quite interested in learning the differences between an American and a European type of startup and scaling. Um, so yeah, I love podcasts and books, anything to do with business and the startup world. Um, in terms of my network would be incredibly important to me. So I have like a group of trusted um, CEOs, there's a WhatsApp group and a few people that I would be very, you know, I'd easily bounce all my Thanks. ideas off. Um, in terms of coaches, I just have a group of a network that I've built up over the years. I don't really believe in having one person can answer all your questions. Um, for me, there's, I have a, you know, a trusted circle of uh, people I would have worked with, I would have worked for, 
And depending on my question or my problem, I just go to to a different people and yeah. whoever's best place to answer the question. So on, I believe it was called the Irish Startup Conference. You said that you were asked to share a tip and I don't know if it was shared tip in under 60 seconds, but you spoke for a, a brief stint of the Irish Startup Conference and the tip that you said was make connections early. Can you explain what you meant by that and why you chose that? Um, I found that like when I was in other countries talking to other startups for whatever reason, um, what became clear to me was how accessible people are in Ireland. You know, we always say it, but it really is true. Um, the first year when we were going out and raising money, like all of the people I contacted, you know, and asked for a cup of coffee, they didn't know me, they didn't know who I was or what I was doing. I can honestly say there's only been one person ever who was not uh, had a cup of coffee with yeah. me. And I remember it because it was just one person. Every other person um, um, agreed to meet and shared information Amazing. and were generous with their connections. And I, I'm, I'm going to estimate that that's in the hundreds. Like I've had yeah. hundreds of cups of coffee with people that I've needed advice from, whether it's in pharmacy retail, if it's in manufacturing, if it's in medical, academic. You know, because of our project, it spans so many um, industries and stakeholders. And that kind of fact finding took a lot of time. So in Ireland, people are one very accessible to you. So if you don't need to call, you cold call them, like you always know somebody who knows somebody that can yeah. put you in touch. And they're really generous, like really generous with their time. I know when I was in London um, on the back of the Virgin Boom uh, with, uh, competition, I met other startups from all across the UK and it just didn't seem to have the same uh, coherence, the startup uh, ecosystem there. You know, we started in Dog Patch Labs. That was absolutely incredible, you know, to get that, to have a year there of the first Fridays, their meetups, how things work. And, you know, with Enterprise Ireland, like the structure is there in Ireland. And I think um, it's definitely in, in this type of world, being small is actually a real benefit to, to a startup or an entrepreneur. There's definitely a great community out there and a lot of people willing to, you know, give you those 15 minutes or 30 minutes for a cup of coffee. Um, I've had similar experiences myself. What's your favorite part of startup life? Uh, again, I'm going to say the flexibility and just the variation in the work. So when, you know, some people don't, like I'm the only non-technical person on our team. So I work with um, doctors and scientists and engineers. So I'm the only person like outside of that and you know being a non-tech CEO yeah but I love the general nature I love being able to, to structure my days one day I'm doing accounts one day I'm out talking to investors one day I'm pitching for competitions so whatever it is I loved that I love that type of um, variation but again it's not for everybody absolutely uh that question's got out of my head what was it again it was yes brand awareness how so to get people to take action i'm a firm believer that you first got to get their attention how do you raise brand awareness are there any avenues that you focus more on than others is it the likes that there's a lot of marketing involved in i don't know seo social media potentially leveraging people at large audiences or is it ceos word of mouth radio what is it that you use or are there multiple avenues that you use to raise brand awareness of the product? Well, currently we're not selling. Um, we're a pre-revenue, pre-launch company. Okay. So we haven't really hit that stage for brand awareness. Once we launch next year, that'll really come into, into fruition for us. But I guess for, for us, it'll be it'll definitely be the social media, like where are mothers and new mothers consuming their data and content and mm. where they're getting their information. So it's kind of twofold for us. One would be online, a lot of Facebook group uh, groups, um, and there's a lot of very specialized uh, online websites where mothers go for information on, on, uh, on you know, baby products and, um, the, uh, you know, that type of that type of thing. Then also the pharmacies, because, you know, um, there's a real education piece around uh, the world's first ever breastfeeding monitor. So at the moment, women wouldn't even know it existed when uh -huh. it out because the only alternative is formula. So really to have um, the, ph the pharmacies um, 
to be there for and they're so trusted in Ireland they have a very high trust level they're highly skilled and specialized so for a mother to be able to go in there and ask uh, you know a professional about um, using a shield and about our product that would be also very important for us so unlike a lot of products we will have both the bricks and mortar um, you know we need to have that as well as uh, the e-commerce solution. Ireland's next unicorn in the making I believe uh, definitely enough people are there to buy a product to help you get to that status if schools secondary schools for our american audience i'm talking high school here if secondary schools could add one mandatory subject to the curriculum but you are the decision maker on what subject it is it can't be a subject that is currently on offer what subject would that be and why so I think for, okay, for high schools, so if it was primary schools, I'd probably go with, um, yeah, okay, for, for high schools, I'm going to say um, just that people should really follow what they are interested in and try and find something for their future career that they love, or at the very least that they find interesting. Because I think if you go after an industry or an education around an industry that is lucrative, um, you know that will you'll eventually burn out and um, you really have to have a core interest in it and i think in the past even in ireland we could have been um a bit guilty of that like saying oh it's dot com it's computers is it ai is it you know what is it at the moment but really i think people should focus on what they have a passion for and they can they can that they're interested in for lifelong learning you touched on primary school did you have an answer for primary school Swimming. <laughs> swimming. Okay. I'm interested to know why you pick swimming. I, I'm a very keen swimmer. Uh, open, like, you know, I, I, I swim the Liffey race every year and I swim wow. uh, swimming for about 15 years. Uh, open water swimming with, uh, with the Leinster Open Sea races. And I guess since the pandemic, there's lots of people now, you know, you see a lot of people down the beach who are, are, are swimming. And I always find it surprising and um, really a bit sad when uh, children leaving primary school can't swim. Mm. You know, even in our, you know, I was lucky enough to be in a swimming club in Mullingar, in Mullingar Jeff. But in fact, the, 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 con, the presentation teachers and nuns that I had in primary school, you know, used to go swimming every week. And I, I guess I thought everyone just had that opportunity. So, yeah, I think it's a, again, it's a lifelong skill and, and actually life saving. I never thought of it because I was uh, lucky enough to be from a fam come from a family where we had to do weekly swimming lessons. But uh, I've been on holidays with people before, and uh, there's been a few people who can't swim and can't get in the pool. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any tricks? I'm going to use the word tricks, probably the wrong word. Are there any trick tricks that you've discovered as a CEO, co-founder, that have helped you stay more focused and productive in a busy day like a busy day-to-day -day schedule whether it's uh write down your to-do list the night before so that that day you just got to focus on that list a anything come to mind yeah this is probably pertinent to me because i would have been you know across the business across all departments i could get a bit fixated with that busy that to-do list and just knocking things off um the list whether they were important or not you know like mm. so I really about I'd say seven or eight years ago really had to change my mindset and instead of getting through all just all of the work really ask myself you know is the task I'm about to do adding value you know and really stick like really work at the things that rather than getting through all the emails answering the emails you know getting back to everyone I kind of had to move away from that mindset and mm. really kind of sit down and think right you know today this task I'm about to do is it adding value to what we have to do today you know in the short term and the medium term but that's definitely something I have to work out yeah okay two final questions for you question one is uh if you've listened to the previous podcast you'll probably know where I'm going with this your loved ones are all safe your house is burning down and you can only save one item what one item would that be I'm going to say some pho photographs, photographs that aren't nice. saved to the computer, you know, like old photographs, um, the albums that haven't been, you know, that aren't up in the cloud or on the backed up to a device. So, yeah, that would be mine. Well, thank you for not choosing your laptop or your phone. Probably the most common answer I get. Final question is, I'd like you to imagine it's the year 2030 and we're talking now as if it's 2030 and you're looking back on the previous decade or nine years. 
you can answer this personally or professionally, but what would you like to be looking back on? Yeah, I'd like to look back on a company that has launched and grown and scaled um, that, you know, that is successful. I mean, we, we we're four years, over four years in business now, so we're coming into a really critical period. So to see it all um, come to fruition and success would be fantastic. And then probably personally health. I think anyone who's had been through surgeries or any any other type of health issues, I think in 10 years, if that if, if it was personal, that would be the only parameter that would matter. I like it. Roseanne, I've had a great pleasure chatting to you, getting to know you a little more. I can certainly see that once you get your products in the hands of your customers, it's solving a big problem for them. And I can see no reason why you can't be. I don't know you laughed at it, but Ireland's next unicorn. Uh, but from my end, uh, I've had a great pleasure getting to know you and chatting to you today. So thank you for being my guest. Thank you, Ryan.